Okay, hello. Um, seventh lecture, not originally planned, um, and probably the last for this module. And um, it's really doing this one is in response to <coughs> people obviously having a little bit of confusion about writing appropriate software to complete the coursework for this module, uh, particularly with what we call bit bashing and controlling our digital electronic devices in order to communicate with them. So with that in mind, uh, I want to just cover these subjects really in this, in this talk. <coughs> Um, and at first they want to talk about data versus information, how the two are very much different and how also at the level we've been operating, sometimes the two do get conflated slightly. So I want to, to sort of try and straighten out some of that confusion because it's not unreasonable to be confused given the way that microprocessors in general and C in particular tends to deal with uh, data and information. Also want to sort of think about how that information is represented, typically with the size of information versus how that it's uh, um, encoded into into data and back again. And finally, I want to sort of get onto the specifics of probably what's been bothering people on this module's um, coursework is actually how we use this data to actually control input-output devices attached to our microprocessors. So the first thing I want to say is, firstly, yeah, what is data really? Uh, and data, I suppose, is just this collection of bits. So if, uh, this will be coming up in a jargon buster there in a minute. And, uh, and really, this is, there's this duality between data and information. Data is really only any use when it's turned into information. The way we turn it into information is by an encoding method. So in other words, some protocol, some technique that we use to, to actually interpret those bare bits that we might see here into information, and we can see the difference. So just a little note to you there, uh, a bit, the fundamental unit of information, really. So truly atomic um, name for, uh, that's a truly, truly atomic unit of information is a bit, a one or a zero, that you can't get a smaller piece of information. And, um, and the other one is this idea of encoding, that's, uh, and the main point I want to make there is encoding is, oddly enough, is nothing to do with this idea of encryption, people talk about codes, but that's something else again, ironically, where encryption is trying to make the thing as hard as possible to read, with a good encoding technique, we're trying to make our data as expressive as possible and easy to translate into information. So just quite an important um, distinction just to make. So uh, something everybody's probably familiar with already is the concept of a byte. And a byte is just a grouping of eight bits. And uh, really the reason for it being eight bits, there's no fundamental reason why it should be that magic power of two. In fact, some of the early machines, we had seven, we had seven bit microprocessors and nine bit micros. And as you well know, it's then grown up to 16, 32, even 64 bit machines these days. But the, uh, the reason why we've got these 16, 32, 64 bit groupings now is generally just a, a doubling from the original eight. So we get these different groupings. And the thing I'm trying to express here is that at the data level, it is just a bunch of bits. No, no numbers necessarily associated with them. And we'll talk about how they can be translated into numbers in a minute. <coughs> so when we start programming, something I do want to make quite clear as well is the concept of bitwise manipulation of data. So quite often we'll, when we start writing C to manipulate data at its lowest level, we come across these quote bitwise operators. And what that means is that each individual corresponding bit of our byte, or larger word for that matter, is logically translated. So in this instance we've got an OR, so an OR1 obviously becomes a 1, 
0, 0 becomes 0, and so on. So the point is that each column, as it were, is acted on individually. And we have these operators that do these bitwise operations. And this can cause a lot of confusion because we also have these concepts called logical operators as well. So a logical or, where we're saying if something or something else is true, then do this. So we typically see things like logical operators in if statements, but typically we'll see bitwise combinations in, <coughs> uh, in, in general processing lines and, and imperative statements. So important to understand that those two are different, and it's not unreasonable to get confused between the two. Uh, I should say that, if, for example, in C, the actual bitwise operators are these single instances of that in a logical or in uh, C is a double slash downwards. So not a huge distinction, and hence it's entirely reasonable to get confused. So here's an example of us using those bitwise operators in a Weaver software there. We've got those two uh, variables which we've uh, bitwise or together. So again, not unreasonably, you might be saying, hang on, something you officially haven't seen here yet. These two items here. So uh, the first thing here, we've got a new type which I haven't really discussed yet. And also we're assigning it using this strange hieroglyphics here. So uh, just going to have a quick aside next couple of slides to talk about those two because they're quite an important concept to have under your hand when you're writing this sort of low-level embedded code like this when you're trying to translate uh, data and manipulate data at this bit level. So the first thing I want to talk about is that char thing that we saw a minute ago. And, and so in previous lecture we looked at the int operator, uh, the, the int data type, I'm sorry. And generally the int data type is 32 bits big, although that in itself is a gross oversimplification, and I'm going to talk about that in a bit more detail in a couple of slides ahead. Uh, but yes, firstly we can see this thing called a char, and it's an 8-bit data structure. Strictly it's also an int, it's also an int as well, which is where all the confusion comes. So I'm going to try and straighten that conversation that, that confusion out at the moment. So yeah, there's another two. There are yet more uh, data types as well in C, but I just wanted to explain about how that eight bit thing is called an int a chart. But although I'm, I'm going to suggest to you in a minute that there's a better alternative to that. <laughs> the other thing that I showed you a moment ago in that previous clip of code was some strange hieroglyphics which said 0x, 0f. Now, this is the signifier in C that we are using base 16 number system, otherwise known as hexadecimal, or you want to be, you want to use the jargon just hex. So it's quite a convenient method, this. Although it's, it takes a moment to get your head around that we're suddenly we're working with a base 16 number system, there, there are great advantages to it when you're manipulating data, and I'll show you in a second. So the first thing, let's just talk about the hex number system. You will notice that normally in our decimal number system, we go up to nine, and then we stick a one on the end, and, we, and the digit wraps. So give us 10. In, in hexadecimal, we go up to 16 before we wrap. So that, that uh, caused the, the problem that we needed to invent six new character numerals. So it's a shame we didn't come up with some little wingdings or something. Um, but they ended up just using the first six letters of the alphabet. So hence we see this strange numbers with, with letters stirred into it. So always look out for that 0x on the front. Of, of one of these hex numbers which tells the compiler that look out hex number coming up. As it happens there's also a base 8 which used to get used a lot in the old days but not so much now so I just want to say that this octal well, exists but I'm not going to say anything more about it. Because I want to talk about <coughs> hex and why it's a useful thing. And, and I think this diagram at the bottom here illustrates the point. 
is that we can, can, it's very easy to consider 4-bit chunks of data. And otherwise known as a nibble, half a byte, get it. Um, but it does mean that with base 16, we can just look at each nibble in isolation. And it gives a nice compromise between able to look at the value of a nibble, but without having to look at great swathes of binary. Because if ever you try and read binary off the screen, the human brain just can't do it. And so I think you will find with practice that the, that the hexadecimal numbering system is quite a nice way and convenient sweet spot between decimal and binary in terms of representing raw data in your bytes and longer words as well. So in this example here we've got 4D. So I'm just going to get on the video. So here's a 4 because that's worth 1, 2, 4 and D which is 1, 4 and 8 if you add up is a decimal 13 which comes to which of course is D in this table so hence this byte can be re represented as 4D okay so that's the data level as it were in other words the way we transport these raw bits around the way we group them we can put them in 8, 16, 32, lots etc but then there's also an extra layer that kind of sits on top of that, really, is how we interpret that, that data. And it just depends on what we're trying to do, really. And in the same way that a bunch of bits might be translated in our JPEG file to that picture of a pretty girl, we might translate it in a different way and get an email or something like that. So let's look at these different methods. This isn't entirely comprehensive, but I just want you to think about these as good examples. So the typical one is I'm going to particularly look at is integer and character. So in the simplest form, if we just think about if we assign the meaning to each of these bits of 1, 2, 4, 8, so in other words, the byte just looks like a binary number, we can express for an 8-bit byte, for example, we could express any number up to from 0, all bits cleared, through to 255, all the bits set. And I'll leave you as an exercise to tell me what 255 will be in hexadecimal. And in this example here, we've got a value of 100 using this bitmap. Now the first thing we'll see here is that we can't express a negative value, obviously. Uh, it just adds up and gives us a value from 0 to 255. What happens if we want to express sine? And so you can imagine the, in the simplest um, case, you may just say, OK, well, what we'll do then is we'll sacrifice one of our bits, probably the top one, to be plus or minus. <coughs> And that seems fairly straightforward at first, so if we want to express our 100 here, it just becomes minus 100 by setting the, net, the minus sign, as it were, on the end of our byte. That sounds a good idea at first, but there's a few issues with that. Um, firstly, is, hang on, that means you could have minus zero, couldn't you? And that implies, hang on, we've wasted a, we've wasted a possible combination. We've got plus and minus zero, and we've got two two different patterns mapping onto the same thing. So we've already got a slight complication. It's also worth mentioning that, in fact, doing arithmetic with just signed bits like that, um, signed integer stuff like that, is, is quite hard to do. It's quite computationally intensive. And because of that, most computer systems and microprocessors use a system known as two's complement to represent negative values instead. Two's complement. It's a funny, it seems a bit odd at first. So in other words, the, the way we're doing this is that an n bit number is defined as the complement with respect to two n. So in other words, I think this example here spells it out pretty clearly. It's the result of subtract, subtracting the number from two n. So you can imagine in 
So 2n is effectively putting another bit on the end there. So we multiply it and by shifting everything up, and then we take the number away. A good example is 1 and minus 1. These are probably the two easiest ways to represent it. So you've got this rather odd case when you get into the negative region of FFFF, FFF, sorry, FF, it actually means minus 1. And the advantage of that is generally uh, arithmetic is a lot easier. You can use much faster and simpler hardware to achieve our arithmetic. And so most systems use that to represent signed integer, in other words, plus and minus integers. And then, then the next <coughs> thing I want you to to, to introduce the idea of when we want to represent a character by that, a, a letter on the screen. If we want to say the famous hello world, how do we, how do we represent to say H-E-L-L-O, etc.? And that is generally done by using groupings of bytes, which are then interpreted as characters. And the universal method for interpreting characters these days is the ASCII standard. American Standard Code for Information Interchange. You've probably heard the word. And all that was was a committee sat down in the 1960s and bashed out a series of codes that they would agree would represent the different letters. And punctuation and uh, also some control characters as well because it was actually based on the idea that these ASCII characters would be used to drive a teletype machine. In the, back in the old days. And you'll see that <coughs> they packed a, a 0 to 127 <coughs> space which could have fitted into a 7-bit word. And that was one of the reasons why early days some computers used 7-bit words. That's expanded now. And in fact, uh, we now go through to things like the uh, Java, um, as a new code, Unicode now, uh, which has all sorts of extra stuff on it. It's a 16-bit field. But at, down in the bottom is it's backwardsly compatible with ASCII. So it's always worth knowing what ASCII is all about. So in other words, this is going to give us an interesting series of mappings. And this is where a lot of confusion occur, occurs. And I, I sympathise. Let's have a look at this example. We've got a bitmap here that I've talked about. And, we and, that could, and I'm going to consider that as, a sign, as an unsigned integer. Sorry. And, that, and if we add up the numbers, that is the equivalent of 77 decimal. Or, if we interpret it a different way, it still is a signed integer, as an unsigned integer, but we represent it in hexadecimal, we get 4D. Or, if we put a third set of goggles on, which is the way I often think of it, uh, and we interpret it in, uh, taking code 77 in ASCII, Looking back in that table, we get an N. So it can be confusing at first, but the point I'm trying to make here is that we've got a raw bitmap which we can choose to interpret in different ways. We can choose, choose to interpret it as an integer or a character, or even if we go to a, an integer, we can then select how we represent to uh, decide to decode e which base we use, even binary. So, with that in mind, let's just quickly revisit the old printf statement we talked about in the previous C programming lecture. And you'll recall about how we could pass along a list of variables and a sort of formatting statement that described how we'd like to interpret that, those variables. And we agreed that it was very easy to get it wrong and make a complete fish because you and now it's starting to make sense as to why that can mess up because if the size of the variable doesn't match the assumed size of the of the format statement all hell will break loose but one one outcome of this is we could have this line of code here so here's a printf statement where i've set my value that we looked at in the in our picture before, and we're passing it three times to our printf statement, but in each instance we're decoding it in a different fashion. That percent %d says look at it as a decimal, percent %x means display it as a hexadecimal, and %c means display it 
as an ASCII character. And lo and behold, we run that line of code, and there we get 77D or M. So think of it as we've passed a, a raw bitmap, we've actually initialized it using the decimal method as it happens, but then we've inspected it in different ways through the prism of these, these three different prisms of the printf statement, formatting statement. So <coughs> now we can, it starts to make sense when I make the statement that I think original C pr uh, data types are horrible. They're a mess. There's several things wrong with the original C data types. Uh, the first one is char, which I hold, I hold responsible for a lot of confusion. So a char was called a char because it was a character. It's eight, in other words, eight bits big. But hang on, we've agreed that it's neither of those things. Firstly, we're using a, a char to, make, to represent numbers. And we've even agreed that we only need seven bits anyway to, to be a char. And then it gets worse because they actually then introduce the concept of an unsigned char, which is almost a contradiction in terms. Uh, there's no such thing as a signed char, surely. Now, integer as well was confusing. Uh, the original C definition which declared a single int. They actually then had long ints and short ints as well, just to make it even more confusing. Instead of tidying it up, it made it worse, because they, the size of that standard integer depended on the particular microprocessor that it's, that it's been in, that it was running on. And... <coughs> Uh, in the early days, most microprocessors were 8-bit machines, and that meant that an int was the same size as a char. So, and so that didn't seem so bad. But then 16 32-bit machines came along. That we've been living with 32-bit machines pretty much for the last 20 to 30 years now. 64 is starting to come along. But it does mean that all the wrong messages have been put out that int is always a 32-bit value. Um, and that's not necessarily the case. So, and, and you can see, so in other words, that original typing mechanism conflated the size of the data with the meaning of the data. So it goes back to this data size versus encoding method. And I'm glad to say that uh, there was a new standard of C, C99, came out in 1999, and one of the many things it introduced was a more explicit type system. Unfortunately, there's a lot of codes that had already escaped into the wild by then. Uh, and so you will still see a lot of the old types around. If you look on the Altera code for the DE0, uh, I'm glad to say they use a derivation of these types that I've listed in the bottom half of this slide. So in other words, a char is what it says on the tin. It's an ASCII character. And, but, and if we want an 8-bit integer, we say we want an 8-bit integer. Here, int 8. There's also an, uh, explicitly saying that it's an unsigned int as well. An int is assumed to be signed because that's the definition of an integer. And so I like this system. I think it's a vast improvement. It's utterly explicit about what you're asking for. And so may I encourage you very, very strongly to use these method, use these types in the future. Now, I've kind of got ahead of myself slightly because I didn't want to throw too much in at once, but um, we looked about encoding there and these new systems. It's also worth just going back slightly to mention that there is another encoding method out there as well, known as floating point, which in some ways is even more confusing because as uh, you might have come across the idea of floating point, and this is where we want to say pi is 3.142, and so we want to be able to express these fractional numbers. And in order to do that, uh, the IEEE, a few years ago, came up with an internationally agreed format for sort of cramming as much information into a 32 or even a 64-bit data field as possible. And they came up with this crazy encoding method. But fair play to them, it's a very good method in that it does a very good job of allowing us to express not only a huge range um, of numbers and fractional numbers, but as, as much possible 
resolution that is achievable for at a given point along that range. So it's important to note that we can't express any number at all, because of, of course, pi, as everybody knows, has been calculated to a million decimal places or whatever that is that we're up to now. And it would be impossible, so we can't express perfect resolution. So in other words, it, it, but it, it rings out, it squeezes as much information into that field as is possible. So floating point is huge. And as you can imagine, uh, it's, got, it's not going to be easy, because what we've effectively got to do is extract an integer value from this field, another integer value from this field, and a sign bit as well, and then apply this vast formula. And that's just before we even start thinking about how we're going to do so, how we're going to say add two numbers together. And because of that, most microprocessors have sprouted what they call FPUs, floating point units. And these are little bits of hardware, not so little in fact in a lot of machines, tacked on the side so that the instruction that, to perform a floating point uh, arithmetic operation calls this specialist piece of hardware. If we can see this example here, you know, just the, this chip is actually taking out quite a bit of real estate here in order to provide this floating point unit just to pull off this one party trick of being able to manipulate these wacky floating point values in, a, in reasonable time. It's worth noting that early versions of floating point were implemented purely in software, and you can imagine how quickly those ran. But most, it's for the last 20 years now, it's pretty much been universally pushed out to hardware. So let's get back to our sort of bit level stuff. And, this, and now I want to come down to really the whole point of this lecture and the motive for this lecture, which was to try and help you write your software in order to control your digital analog hybrid devices that we're, talk that we're using in this coursework now. And let's give you a clue on how, how it all works. The first thing we need to understand is that the devices we're controlling are, quote, memory maps. So in other words, we've got little paces in the memory system where if we write to those values in memory, we don't hit the RAM and, and store a number into the memory, but instead the information is diverted and written into an interface or a device. So, in other words, the information, instead of being written to memory, it's been read, but written to that machine, to a device. And that might simply be a bunch of bits that we're going to look at in a second. Conversely, we might read the memory location, and instead of reading the actual memory, we read the location, but instead we get back some data from a device. It might even be a completely different device, even though it's at the same memory location. But don't dwell on that too much. So a quick jargon buster there, just about memory map. In other words, we've got a memory location, as far as the microprocessor is concerned, where instead of just being able to remember the last number that was written there, we just see information appear out of nowhere, which in the case of, say, your D2A, if we write to it there, it just causes the D2A to magically do stuff at output a given voltage. And then the A to D, we might read that same location and get something back. So let's get more specific now. We'll think about the GPIO pins that we're looking at on the D0 board that we're using in the labs here. And in this instance, Nigel, thank you very much, has supplied us with one of these memory mapped registers where each bit of the register controls the voltage that comes out on these GPIO pins on the outside of our device. So it's dead simple. We write a zero, we get naught volts coming out of that pin. We write a one, we get five volts coming out of the next pin along, and so on. So you'll, hear, you'll sometimes hear T1, 
Techies talking about bit bashing, and this is where you're bashing the, the bits in software to control the hardware. It's, it's it, the slightly disparaging name is because from a computational point of view, it's not very efficient. But when uh, hammers are this cheap, you'll find that they can crack a variety of nuts very, very quickly and flexibly. So we okay. So we've controlled those pins. And that's all very nice. But what we could then do, for example, is hang something on the outside of those pins. We control, so we can control an another device at second hand, as it were, by putting the appropriate whispers out through, through the pins. So here's a good example. We might have a seven segment display. And for every, every bit that we write to here, this allows us to switch a, an LED on or off and thus generate a pattern there. So the point I want, uh, now here's an exercise that I'd like you to do after, the, after this lecture. What do we need to write to that register to, to draw, say, a, letter, uh, a numeral five on that LED? Is it an ASCII, is it, is it its ASCII code? I'm gonna tell you it's not, it's gonna be something else. And is it a universal truth? No, it's not either. So let's have a look at that after. So, now let's get through to even more specific to the thing that's very much on your minds at the moment. And this is the coursework where we're actually trying to control a bit-driven interface by waggling bits. So here, we might pass different sequences down by hitting that register with different values, one after the other. And look, it's going to what are we going to see coming out on the output here as well, logic analyzer again, that we talked about a couple of lectures back. And we can see now that it's actually evolving in time. But as we write different values at different bits, that's going to cause different things to happen on different pins. So there's another exercise to think about. The converse of the previous question is, uh, which said, what, what do we need to write to get this effect? If we wrote those, that sequence of bits, what would we see on the outside of those GPIO pins of our device? So that's it. I hope that's put that things in context a bit for you there. There's a lot of confusion out there, and it's not unreasonable to be confused, because... C, it's very low level language and also some of its roots are lost in the past <laughs> and, and that causes this horrible conflation of the idea of how big a piece of data is versus what the meaning of that data is and things like that. So as long as you can hold that thought in your mind that there is data and then we apply encoding in order to extract information or meaning from that data. There's the two layers. It makes it a lot, lot easier. And it makes it a lot, lot easier to understand this second point here, which is that C is a bit of a nasty language. In a, as I've said before, it's a very low-level language. And uh, it allows us to either perform information-level operations, like say we could add two numbers together, or we can actually go in and murder those bits lobotomize those bits individually directly as well. And so there's this duality of, of data and information, which I don't think is made quite clear enough uh, by the C language in general and people studying these languages in, in, in particular. So to give an example, we could do a multiply by saying times two on a word, or we could say, ah, but we, I know that to multiply by two, all I've got to do is shift it left by one bit. And in fact, that's something that C will let you do. Finally, there's this point about once we understand that data is just patterns of bits, we can write those, we can create appropriate patterns, and they have only any meaning of beam patterns. And by writing them to memory map devices, we can cause bits to change within those devices, sometimes at second hand when we do things like write to a register that controls another register and things like that. So that can be a little bit tricky. But just bear in mind that we're just creating data patterns at that point. In other words, we've got 
information, but it's even more obscure and specific to the device that we're talking about, maybe just your particular PCB. So I hope that's helped. And as I say, good luck with your programming or during your integration of your PCBs.